I've actually been waiting for, uh, by the phone for a call from Ted for years. <laughs> and in fact, in uh, 2000, I was ready to talk about eBay, but no call. In 2003, I was ready to do a talk about uh, the school foundation and social entrepreneurship. No call. Um, in 2004, I started participant productions, and we had a really good first year, and no call. And finally, I get a call last year, and then I have to go up after J.J. Abrams. <laughs> you, you, you've got a cruel sense of humor, Ted. Uh, when I first moved to Hollywood from Silicon Valley, I, I had some misgivings. Um, but I found that there were some advantages to being in Hollywood. <laughs> and in fact, some advantages to owning your own media company. <laughs> and I also found that Hollywood and Silicon Valley had a lot more in common than I would have dreamed. Hollywood has its sex symbols, and the Valley has its sex symbols. <laughs> Hollywood has its rivalries, and the Valley has its rivalries. <laughs> Hollywood gathers around power tables, and the Valley gathers around power tables. So it turned out there was a lot more in common than, than I would have dreamed. But I'm actually here today to tell a story. And part of it is a personal story. Um, when Chris invited me to speak, he said people think of you as a, a bit of an enigma, and they want to know what drives you a bit. And what really drives me is, is a vision of the future that I think we all share. It's a world of peace and prosperity and sustainability. And uh, when, we, when we heard a lot of the presentations over the last couple of days, uh, Ed Wilson and, and the pictures of James Noctui, I think we all realized how far we have to go to get to this new version of humanity that I like to call Humanity 2.0. And it's also something that um, resides in each of us to close what I think are the, the two big calamities in the world today. Uh, one is the, the gap in opportunity, um, this gap that President Clinton last night called uneven, unfair, and unsustainable. And out of that comes poverty and illiteracy and disease and all these evils that we see around us. But perhaps the other bigger gap is what we call the hope gap. And someone at some point came up with this very bad idea that an ordinary individual couldn't make a difference in the world. And I think that's just a, a horrible thing. And so uh, chapter one really begins today with all of us, because within each of us is the power to equal those opportunity gaps and to close the hope gaps. And if the men and women of TED can't make a difference in the world, I don't know who can. Um, and for me, uh, a lot of this started when I was younger, and my family used to go camping in upstate New York, and there really wasn't much to do there for the summer except get beaten up by my sister or, or read books. And so I used to read authors like uh, James Michener and James Clavell and Anne Rand, and their stories made the world seem a very small and interconnected place. And it struck me that if I could write stories that were, that were about this world as being small and interconnected, that maybe I could get people interested in the issues that affected us all and maybe engage them to make a difference. Um, I didn't think that was necessarily the best way to make a living. Um, so I decided to, to go on a path to become uh, financially independent so I could write these stories as quickly as I could. Um, I then had a bit of a wake-up call when I was 14, and my dad came home one day and announced that he had cancer, and it looked pretty bad. And, and what he said was he wasn't so much afraid that he might die, but that he hadn't done the things that he wanted to with his life. And knock on wood, he's still alive today, many years later, but for a young man that made a real impression on me, that one never knows how much time one really has. So I set out in a hurry. Um, I, I studied engineering, uh, started a couple of uh, businesses that I thought would be the ticket to financial freedom. Uh, one of those businesses was a computer rental business called Micros on the Move, which was very well named because people kept stealing the computers. <laughs> so, so I figured uh, I needed to learn a little bit more about business, so I went to Stanford Business School and studied there. And while I was there, I made friends with a fellow named Piero Midiar, who's here today. And Piero, I apologize for this. Uh, this is a photo from the old days. And just after I'd graduated, Pierre came to me with this idea to help people buy and sell things online with each other. And with the wisdom of my Stanford degree, I said, Pierre, what a stupid idea. <laughs> and uh, needless to say, I was right. Uh, <laughs> 
but right after that, uh, Pierre, in, in 96, Pierre and I left our full-time jobs to build eBay as a company. And the rest of that story, uh, you know, the company went public two years later and uh, is today one of the best known companies in the world. Uh, hundreds of millions of people use it uh, in uh, hundreds of countries and so on. But for me personally, it, it was a real change. Uh, I, I, I went from living in a house with five guys in Palo Alto and living off their leftovers to all of a sudden having all kinds of resources. And I wanted to figure out how I could take the blessing of these resources and, and share it with the world. And around that time, I met John Gardner, uh, who was a remarkable man. He was the architect of the Great Society programs under Lyndon Johnson in the 1960s. And I asked him what he felt was the best thing I could do or anyone could do to make a difference in the long-term issues facing humanity. And John said, bet on good people doing good things. Bet on good people doing good things. And that really resonated with me. Um, I started a foundation um, to bet on these good people doing good things, these leading, innovative, nonprofit folks who are using business skills in a very leveraged way to solve social problems. Uh, people today we call social entrepreneurs. And to put a face on it, people like Muhammad Yunus, who started the Grameen Bank, has lifted 100 million people plus out of poverty around the world won the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, but there's also a lot of people that you don't know. Uh, folks like Ann Cotton, who started a group called CAMFED in Africa uh, because she felt girls' education was lagging. And she started it about 10 years ago. And today, she educates uh, over a quarter million African uh, girls. And uh, somebody like Dr. Victoria Hale, who started the world's first nonprofit pharmaceutical company and whose first drug um, will, will be fighting uh, visceral leishmaniasis, also known as black fever. And by 2010, she hopes to eliminate this disease, which is really a scourge in the developing world. And so this is, this is one way to bet on, on good people doing good things. And a lot of this comes together in a philosophy of change that I, I find really is powerful. Um, it's what we call invest, connect, and celebrate. And invest, if you see good people doing good things, invest in them, invest in their organizations, or in business, invest in these folks. Um, connecting them together through conferences like a TED brings so many powerful connections, or through the World Forum on uh, Social Entrepreneurship that my foundation does at Oxford every year. Um, and celebrate them, tell the stories, because not only are there good people doing good work, but their stories can help close these gaps of hope. And it was this last part of the mission, uh, the, the celebrate part, that really got me back to thinking when I was a kid and wanted to tell stories to get people involved in the issues that affect us all. And uh, a light bulb went off, which was first that I didn't actually have to do the writing myself. I could find writers. And then the next light bulb was better than just writing. What about film and TV to get out to people in a big way? And I thought about the films that inspired me, uh, films like Gandhi and Schindler's List. And I wondered who was doing these kind of films today. And there really wasn't uh, a specific company that was focused on the, on the public interest. So in 2003, I started to make my way around Los Angeles uh, to talk about the idea of a pro-social media company. And I was met with a lot of encouragement. Uh, one, one, of the, one of the lines of encouragement that I heard over and over was, the streets of Hollywood are littered with the carcasses of people like you who think you're going to come to this town and make movies. And then, of course, there was the, uh, the other adage, the surest way to become a millionaire is to start by being a billionaire and go into the movie business. <laughs> um, undeterred, uh, in January of 2004, I started Participant Productions with the vision to be a global media company focused on the public interest. And our mission is to produce entertainment that creates and inspires social change. And we don't just want people to see our movies and say that was fun and forget about it. We want them to actually get involved in the issues. Uh, in 2005, we launched our, our first slate of films, uh, Murder Ball, North Country, Syriana, and Good Night and Good Luck. And much to my surprise, they were noticed. We, we ended up with 11 uh, Oscar nominations for these films. And it turned out to be a pretty good year for this guy. Perhaps more importantly, tens of thousands of people joined the advocacy programs and the activism programs that we created to go around the movies. And we had an online component of that, our community site called participate.net. But with our social sector partners like the ACLU and PBS and the Sierra Club and the NRDC, 
once people saw the film, there was actually something they could do to make a difference. Um, one of these films in particular um, called North Country was actually kind of a, a box office disaster, but it, it, it was a film that starred Charlize Theron, and it was about women's rights, women's empowerment, uh, domestic violence, and so on. And we released the film at the same time that the Congress was debating the renewal of the Violence Against Women Act. And with screenings on the Hill and discussions and with our social sector partners like the National Organization of Women, the film was widely credited with influencing the successful renewal of the act. And that to me spoke volumes because it's, the, the film started about a true life story about a woman who was harassed, uh, sued her employer, led to a landmark case that led to the Equal Opportunity Act and the Violence Against Women Act and others. And then the movie about this person doing these things then led to this great uh, renewal. Um, and so again, it goes back to betting on good people doing good things. Um, speaking of which, our fellow Tedster, Al, uh, I first saw Al do his slideshow presentation on, on global warming in May of 2005. At that point, I thought I knew something about global warming. I thought it was a 30 to 50 year problem. And after we saw his slideshow, it became clear that it was much more urgent. And so right afterwards, uh, I met backstage with, uh, with Al and with Lawrence Bender, who was there, and Lori David, and uh, Davis Guggenheim, who was running uh, documentaries for participant at the time. And with Al's blessing, we decided on the spot to turn it into a film because we felt that we could get the message out there far more quickly than having Al go around the world uh, speaking to audiences of 100 or 200 at a time. And you know, there's another adage in Hollywood that nobody knows nothing about anything. Um, and I, I really thought that this was going to be a straight to PBS uh, charitable initiative. And so it was, it was a great shock to all of us when the film really captured the public interest. Uh, and today is mandatory viewing in schools in England and Scotland and most of Scandinavia. Um, we've sent 50,000 DVDs to um, high school teachers in the US and it's really changed the debate on global warming. Um, it was also a pretty good year for this guy. Uh, we, we now call Al the George Clooney of global warming. <laughs> Um, and for participant, this is just the start. Uh, everything we do looks at the major issues in the world, and we have uh, about 10 films in production right now and dozens others in development. Uh, I'll quickly talk about a few coming up. Uh, one is Charlie Wilson's War with Tom Hanks and Julia Roberts, and it's the true story of Congressman Charlie Wilson and how he funded the Taliban to fight the Russians in Afghanistan. And we're also doing a, a movie called The Kite Runner based on the book The Kite Runner, also about Afghanistan, and we think once people see these films, they'll have a much better understanding of that part of the world and the Middle East in general. Uh, we premiered a film called The Chicago 10 at Sundance this year. It's based on the protesters at the Democratic Convention in 1968, Abby Hoffman and crew. And again, a story about a small group of individuals who, who did make change in the world. Uh, and a, a documentary that we're doing on Jimmy Carter and his Mideast peace efforts over the years. And in particular, we've been following him on his uh, recent book tour, um, which as many of you know, has been very non-controversial, <laughs> which is really bad for getting people to come see a movie. In closing, I, I'd like to say that um, everybody has the opportunity to make change in their, their own way. And all the people in this room have, have done so through their business lives or their philanthropic work or, or their other interests. And one thing that I've learned is that there's never one right way to make change. Uh, one can do it as a tech person or as a finance person or a nonprofit person or as an entertainment person. But every one of us is all of those things and more. And I believe if we do these things, we can close the opportunity gaps, we can close the hope gaps, and I can imagine if we do this, the headlines in 10 years might read something like these. New AIDS cases in Africa fall to zero. US imports its last barrel of oil. <laughs> uh, Israelis and Palestinians celebrate 10 years of peaceful coexistence. <laughs> and I like this one, uh, snow's return to Kilimanjaro. <laughs>
And, and finally, uh, an eBay listing uh, for one well-traveled slideshow, uh, now obsolete, uh, museum piece, please contact Al Gore. <laughs> Um, and I, I believe that working together, we can make all of these things happen. And I want to thank you all for having me here today. It's been a real honor. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs>